two. One of the really amazing things about Disney World is how incredibly well themed even all the little details are. Uh, this is particularly evident when you go to the Magic Kingdom. The Magic Kingdom is actually, you know, built of these different kingdoms. You've got uh, Fantasyland and Tomorrowland and Frontierland and Liberty Square and all these different little places. And when you go from one land to the next, there's this kind of immersive experience where what you see and what you hear and everything around you remind you that you're in kind of this different little spot. And so each one of them is themed and it seems all sorts of details to make it sort of a special experience. And when you walk from one to the next, everything changes. Not just the, the, the things that you see where the architecture is different or the colors or the plants, but even what you hear. There's actually background music that changes just by walking from one area to the next. And sometimes, what you smell. They pipe in certain smells and fragrances depending on where you happen to be in the park. And if you've been uh, down Main Street, you've smelled fresh baking cookies. <laughs> and you are nowhere near the bakery, so they pipe in this artificial scent. So you Oh, the cookies. And you just start kind of gravitating to make sure you make it to the bakery so you can buy and eat those cookies, right? So it is this really kind of neat environment where you're immersed in this world for just a few moments. What we do in the church with both our Sunday of worship and just even the things around us are intended to be an immersive experience. The church invented the concept of the multimedia experience where worship was not just vocal, but there are things that you heard and things that you saw, things that you tasted, and even things that you smelled. So that everything around you was rich with meaning. Some of these meanings are from scripture. Some of these meanings are from tradition. Some of them are of just practical experience, but all of them come with this sense of meaning and purpose and symbolism, so it becomes an immersive experience, not just like Disney to have a good time or to be in a fantasy realm, but to point us, body and soul, to the worship of our Lord and King. So part of what we're doing with this instructed Eucharist is to remind us and point out elements of this immersive experience. Things that we don't even always pay attention to. Some things we might not have even known about, yet we benefit from, even if we don't realize it's happening all around us. I liken this to being told that someone is praying for you. Now they can be praying for you whether you know about it or not. Even now. People not only all over the congregation, but all over, period, are praying for Joni and Brooke as Brooke struggles in the hospital. Those prayers, we are promised, are effective. And it is right, and it is good for us to do so, and it is a blessing for them to intercede on their behalf and lift them to the throne of God. Whether or not they have any idea that we as a whole are praying for them, or you in particular are praying for them, they still benefit from that and are blessed by them. <laughs> Yet there is a special blessing that happens in knowing, in being told, in it being explicit that people are praying for you. For somebody to come up to you, to you and say, I just want you to know that I've been praying for them. I've been praying for you. And you, just, oh. you feel that extra sense of connection, right? That kind of extra sense of blessing. It doesn't change the fact that they've been praying for you, but it just adds something new, a, a depth or a richness. So with this instructed Eucharist, both the Liturgy of the Word, which we did last Sunday, and then the Liturgy of the Table, just like in the, word, in, in the road to Emmaus, where the resurrected Christ teaches from the Scriptures, and then they see Him at the breaking of the bread. We're going to talk about some of these details. We're going to delineate some of these experiences, both what is immersive around us and then the specific prayers and elements and action of communion 
so that we can get the extra blessing of knowing a little more about not only what we're doing, but what's happening around us all of the time. This is an eminently scriptural idea Back in the book of Exodus, there are instructions about how the tabernacle is to be constructed. The tabernacle, which will be the sign of the holy presence of God, which uh, will hold the Ten Commandments, which will hold other signs of God's power, the budded staff, the jar of manna. And it was to be built out of certain materials with certain dimensions. It was supposed to look a certain way. In Leviticus we hear about the very specific work of the priests and what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to wear, even the colors and the fabrics and everything else. In First Chronicles, we see some of the instructions that Solomon is given about the construction of the temple. Once again, specific dimensions, specific colors, specific materials, because everything points to something. Everything means something. It was an immersive experience like being in Disney where even the things you didn't realize were pointing you heavenward, everything around you was intended to focus and orient your heart and your life on the praise of God. We see that even in the book of Revelation. We've mentioned that a few times now, that in the book of Revelation, uh, both chapters 4 and 21, we get this peak of heavenly worship that we actually share in on a Sunday morning. Heaven and earth meet. And as those eternal prayers are going around the throne of the Lamb, we are echoing them here and now. But when uh, the book of Revelation starts to detail the new Jerusalem, the holy city of God, it starts talking about what it's made of. Different stones, different <clears throat> materials, different objects which point and symbolize different things. So to have a worship service and a worship setting where stuff means something is both of scriptural warrant and just kind of practical human nature. That we sort of understand and our hearts and our minds and our bodies that they kind of resonate with being touched on multiple levels of our senses. So, we have gathered with work already done in advance. Uh, an altar guild has helped uh, prep the table and get the vessels cleaned and prepared and the linens washed and ready. Uh, we have had musicians pick <coughs> music and practice and now prepare so that when we come together they may help lead us in musical worship. Uh, we've had people in the office work on reading material, work on bulletins, print stuff out. We had ladies come to the office and fold everything up and so it can be distributed and used by you both Sunday morning and in the week to come. All these things have been happening in order to be ready for this moment where we can join together in prayer and in praise. And part of what we're doing right here and right now is we are immersed within a gospel story that even the church architecture ought to point to. Now this being the worship center, um, it lacks a few of the traditional elements that you might be able to see, whether in the sanctuary or in another church. But we're going to go over a couple of concepts that I think are worth being reminded of. Where you are sitting, where you are gathered within a church is properly referred to as the nave. Nave, like the word navy, because churches are constructed to look like boats. If you've never noticed that, they have a certain shape, that sort of long rectangular shape. Some of them even have the beams that go across that kind of remind you of the inner hull of a boat. They're constructed for a particular purpose. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter retells the story of Noah and how through the ark, Noah and his family were saved from death and destruction and carried on the waters of the flood. So you have been saved from death or destruction, Peter writes, through the waters of baptism. And in baptism, we sail in the ship of Christ who can bring us through the storms and the waves of life. He who knew fishermen and he who calmed 
those storms and those waves. When we gather in church, we are reminded that through our baptisms and His grace, we float in this life on those winds and storms, and we are saved from death through the water. Some churches like we have in the uh, sanctuary have a transept where down the center it splits off to the right and to the left. Uh, over in the sanctuary, on one side we have the vesting room where the, the, the clergy and where the choir are, are putting on their vestments. On the right, that altar guild where they're prepping those uh, vessels and those linens and getting the flowers ready. We call it a transit because it crosses across the center of something. If you were to fly above our church or take a peek on Google Maps, even the floor plan of the church points to the gospel because with the transept and the nave, it looks like a cross. You might not have known it, and yet we benefit by it. Even the small things, even the things we don't understand or notice, but pointing unfailingly to him. I am uh, up here on this little stand of an area that we might refer to as the chancel. It's a part set aside, intended for uh, recognition as being a holy and a special spot. This is the place where the altar is contained, where the words of the Lord are proclaimed. In the sanctuary, you can tell the chancel because it not only has a step, it has the altar rails around it. So there's some practical reasons for that. You know, if you're somebody who kneels at communion, have you ever tried to go down and go up without an altar rail? I mean, you always have that, that, that moment, I don't know where my body's going. An altar rail helps that. There's also a practical element that within the early English church, they built, altar, well, they built the rails around the altar to keep the dogs from peeing. And yet, we can see the symbolism today that there is something set apart, something holy, something worth recognizing and keeping special, and that would be up here in this chancel area. We have uh, an altar, which is also taking both an Old Testament and a New Testament concept of worship requiring sacrifice. We give something up in order to ascribe worth to God. In the uh, sacrificial model of temple worship, it was the sacrifice of animals and their bloodshed to uh, forgive sins, to atone for mistakes and bring us back with God. The altar here is what we see in the book of Hebrews, where it is an earthly of an eternal altar where Christ himself is both the everlasting priest and the one true victim, where through his sacrifice on the cross, there is blood good once and for all. No more need to have animals sacrificed again and again and again, but through the one sacrifice of Christ, atonement has been made for all, and the redemption of sin is offered and it is good forever. We have candles lit up here around the altar for Christ, as we are reminded in the beginning of John's Gospel, He is the light of the world. If you have been around before the service to see them lit, or you pay attention after the service to see them extinguished, they are done so in a particular pattern and method that also point to something beyond itself. We can refer to that side of the altar as you're facing it as the epistle side, and this side of the altar as you're facing it as the gospel side. That was more clear when the, uh, the scriptural readings used to be read on that side, the right side of the altar, and then the gospel would be read from the left side. Again, splitting them up side by side to offer specific honor and praise to the words and the life and the witnesses of Christ as found in the Gospels. So when we see the candles lit or extinguished, they're done with a particular pattern. When I light them, first you light the right, then you light the left. When we put them out, first you put out the left, 
and then you put out the right. Why? Because the gospel never burns alone. The gospel never burns alone. Because Christ has not come to abolish the law and the prophets. He has come to fulfill them. So the words and the life and the witness of Christ found in the gospel happens not in a vacuum, but within the context of all of God's word, Old Testament and New. The gospel never stands alone. Though we honor him and his life, it stands in union with all of scripture from beginning to end. You will notice uh, behind the altar we have this curtain. Now, it serves a very practical purpose in this building because there's a door back there. And it's ugly and it's weird. And nobody wants to be concentrating on the body and blood of Christ and thinking, well, maybe he's going to come through the door. Or maybe I should run out. Or I don't know. Why is there a door there? So we've covered it with this kind of nice curtain. But this actually has a name as well. This is referred to as a dos, or a docile, or a rare dos, or all sorts of funny little names, which basically say human nature is a little lazy, and it's prone to wander. Our focus, especially as Father Dave goes on and on and on, starts to drift around. The dos or, uh, or, or docile pulls our eyes back to something of interest and of note. Just as if you were to walk in a room that was perfectly white and it had one red piece of furniture, where would your eye go? To the red piece of furniture. The DOS then says it's going to be a specific color or a look. It's going to stand out, whatever it is. Why? Because as our eyes wander, we're going to naturally catch on what stands out and it's going to pull our focus back to the altar and the cross. Practical, but for a deeper reason. Uh, you will see over on the side our credence table, which holds some of the vessels that we will use during the service. And to the side of that, attached to the wall, an ombre and a tabernacle. It's really kind of the same thing for our purposes. Uh, an ombre, which would be a cabinet that's attached to a wall, a tabernacle, uh, most properly to be behind an altar, but we kind of have to do it over there, but holding the reserve sacrament. Uh, bread and wine that we've already prayed for and asked the Holy Spirit to transform into body and blood, but that we didn't eat. It was sort of left over. But it is still the body and the blood, and so we hold it in a place which can be special and which can be honored. And next to it, you see a sanctuary lamp, a candle that burns 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When that candle is lit, it is signifying to all of us that the presence of Christ is here. If we cleared out the reserved sacrament, that candle would be extinguished. But you can come here day or night. You can come here in the middle of the week. And if you see that candle going, you can know that the reserved sacrament is in the ombre, and the presence of Christ is here. So, <clears throat> immediately behind the altar, this large wooden cross, and we see draped over it a particular color. It matches the color that I'm wearing, and some of the colors we have around, the liturgical colors, to point to a liturgical season. Just like our lives kind of go up and down, and and the calendar moves from season to season. Every year as we retell and we participate within the story of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, we have these particular ups and downs within that gospel story. And so these seasons of the church year help point us and focus us to particular moments or themes within those ups and downs of the seasons. And the colors... Help us signify that we are in one season versus another. We are in Lent, a penitential season, and so I am wearing purple, and you can see purple around. Uh, at a time of great joy and celebration, like an Easter or a Christmas, you'll see white, or you might see gold. Uh, during the time of Epiphany and the season after Pentecost, it will be green, 
That's kind of our standard operating color of just a simple plain green, reminding us that the presence of God is not with us just in the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, but even in the everyday, ordinary times of our lives. Coming for Passion Week or for to celebrate a martyr, you might see a, a dark blood red. But these little changes, even if they're not registering to us, they're registering to us in some way, somehow, we're seeing little things that are different and are preparing ourselves to be receptive to why things are different, what is happening within the story of Christ. So you're seeing, uh, I am wearing on the outside, it is purple, this is a chasuble, uh, almost like a liturgical poncho, but this chasuble uh, is designating two different things. First of all, it is, it is designating the presider of the Eucharist. Even if there were multiple priests here, only one of them wears a chasuble. That's the one who is actually behind the table and leading the Eucharistic service. The chasuble ex itself is to point us to the one garment of Christ there at the cross when the soldiers strip him and they start dividing his clothing among them, they come across a tunic that cannot be divided because it is woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they cast lots for it that the winner might be able to take the tunic of Christ. So even the clothing that I wear point to that. Underneath it, I am wearing a stole. It is a sign and symbol of my office as a priest, as a presbyter, as an elder. It represents the yoke of Christ that I have taken on to be his servant and to help lead his people. Underneath that, wearing a white alb. Alb simply coming from the Latin <coughs> word for white. That regardless of what I may be wearing on the outside, regardless of liturgical color, or regardless of my uh, rank or office, whether I'm a priest with the stole this way, or I'm a deacon, where the stole crosses across my body in a diagonal angle, whether I am the presider, whether I am a bishop wearing the big funny hat and carrying a stick, at the base of it, I am wearing the white garment of purity given to those who had been newly baptized. In the early church, there was rich, there was poor, there was clean, there was dirty, there was old, there was young, there was woman, there was man. But once they went into the waters of baptism, they were all clothed in a clean, pure, white robe to be reminded that in Christ they had been made new and clean and pure. So even the things that I wear are all trying to carry this meaning. Uh, churches are traditionally oriented, even geographically, to points to this. <coughs> Typically, so that people are facing east. Why would you face east in worship? So that we would be pointed towards Jerusalem, the holy city. Now, because of a quirk of our floor plan, you are not facing east. I am. So on your behalf, as I am here at the altar, I have oriented myself so that my focus might be towards our Lord, who not only has proclaimed Jerusalem to be the holy city, but just as the sun rises in the east every morning, so Christ has been risen from the grave, and even the direction of our bodies can bear witness to that. And so we gather here for this uh, Eucharistic service. Eucharist coming from the Greek term that simply means to give thanks or thanksgiving. We are giving God thanks for what he has done for us, in us, and through us. As we mentioned in the Liturgy of the Word, we are joining with heavenly worship who are saying some of these same prayers and praises. We are celebrating within the Passover story, the singular moment of most importance within Judaism, where they are freed from slavery and bondage in Egypt, 
where they are brought through the plagues and through the blood of the Lamb placed on their homes, the angel of death passes over them. And they are then led through the Red Sea, parted on the left and on the right, and brought back to the land of promise. And as Jesus celebrated a Passover supper on that last supper with his disciples, so we too share in this for this Eucharistic service. This has been so from the very beginning of the church. Acts chapter 2, uh, reminding you what we said last week. What did the early church do together? They came together to remember the apostle teaching the breaking of the bread and the prayers. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he reminds them that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, just as Christ in heaven, the eternal high priest, and the eternal victim, who dies once and for all, we share in that moment when we gather around this altar and we say those same words and those same prayers. We celebrate together the sacrament of communion from the Latin sacramentum, which is the Latin translation of the Greek word used in the New Testament, mysterion, or mystery. In the East, they are very clear to refer to these as holy mysteries. When we celebrate the sacrament, we are saying, it is mysterious how God does this. It is mysterious how he accomplishes it. It is mysterious, frankly, why he would love us so much. And yet, he does. And so we gather within this holy mystery with proper matter, stuff, meaning bread and wine, just as Jesus shared, so do we, with proper intent, meaning we have come with the purpose of both sharing in his body and blood, proclaiming his praise and honor, and joining with the angels, with the archangels, with all of those who have gone on before, so that together we might lift up his holy name. And then we come with the proper form. Not saying, hey, yo, Jesus, come down and get this bread. Kazam! But instead, we use the words that Jesus himself used. We use the words that the apostles taught. And that Christians in every tribe, tongue, language, and nation have shared together to be a part of one body, his body, here on earth. You see, that's another gift of being part of the liturgy. If you recall from last week, I referred to this as the liturgia, the work of the people. And I reminded us, it's not just the work of we people, it is the work of all of God's people. And when we echo these words, when we participate in these actions, we are doing it with them. People we've never met, people who live in different parts of the world, people who have died hundreds if not thousands of years ago, and all of those who will still continue to come and to sing and to praise. We share in those words because we share in one body. And that is one of the gifts of this liturgy, that that liturgia is not just our work. It's not dependent on how clever I happen to be or how holy I happen to be. It's not dependent on how you feel at any given time. It's not dependent on how awesome the music is or how right on the preaching happens to be. All those things could be miserable today. All of those things could be off today. The music could just sort of clunk in your ear and it just doesn't move you. The sermon could be terrible. And I could be painfully boring, if not flat out wrong. You could be coming in a rotten mood. You could be coming weighed down by grief and sadness. You could be coming and it's just one of those days that you can't focus. And you're just sort of distracted. And it's not up to you. And it's not up to me. And when we share in this liturgy, it's not just the work of we the people. It is the work of all of the people of God, all of the body of Christ, so that even when you can't hold on, the liturgy holds on for you. Even when you can't hold on, the liturgy holds on to you. 
So that is where we are next. About to celebrate within the service the offertory, where we offer our gifts for the praise of God. Some of those gifts will be money. You'll put in tithes, you'll put in offerings, we'll pass these plates, and we'll bring them forward, offering them to God in honor, worship, and in praise for the building up of this place and the continuance of his ministries here. We will also offer typically musical worship with the talents and abilities of God's people. They will offer to him praise through instruments or through song. We can also offer ourselves in this time. As Paul begins Romans chapter 12, to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That is our spiritual act of worship. So right here, right now, we're preparing before we meet him in body and blood. Before we know him in the breaking of the bread, we offer our lives inside and out. Bodies and souls. In this immersive environment and immersive experience, to put our focus on him right here, right now, give him our very best. Therefore, ascribe the Lord the honor to his name, free offerings, come into his courts with praise.
over to the altar for the liturgy of the table. Here at the altar, you will note that on top of it immediately is this uh, long white cloth referred to as the fair linen. Uh, this long white cloth intended to remind us <clears throat> of the shroud that the body of Christ is wrapped in before being laid in the tomb. On top of the fair linen, there's another smaller piece. It's a square piece, the corporal. Corporal from corpus or body because this is where the body and blood will be located. We can sort of consider this as the playing field where all the important stuff is to happen. And it draws a boundary from everything on the altar, all of the gifts, to very specifically what I'm going to be praying for, that the Spirit would bless and con consecrate so it would be for us the body and the blood of Christ himself. <clears throat> uh, the bread we are using uh, could be leavened or unleavened. It is unleavened right now in this Lenten penitential season. This is actually matzah, so very similar to the bread that would have been used for a Passover supper, which is, uh, as Jesus celebrated on that last supper, so we could commemorate as well, even with the type of bread that we use. Uh, that's very traditional in the West to use an unleavened bread. In the East, they would use a leavened bread, with leavening being a symbol for new life, as our life is found in Christ, and to be a part of a singular loaf, one loaf for one body, which is broken on our behalf that we might receive together. I receive the wine and the bread as other offerings and gifts that we present to God for his glory. Uh, the water comes forward and I ask for God's blessings in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we take the water and add just a little bit into everything holding wine. Partly this is done to join with the apostles because at that time, in a practical sense, all of their wine was mixed with water. It also is carrying meaning, however, that now the divine nature of Christ and the human nature of Christ are mixed and in intermingled together never to be separated. Also reminding us that at the crucifixion, once Jesus dies on the cross, the centurion stabs him in the side with a spear. What comes out? Blood and water. I carry the water back over to the lavabo bowl, lavabo for washing, and I remember the words of Psalm 51. Wash me, O Lord, of my iniquities, and cleanse me from my sin, that I might be not only physically cleaner before I start handling stuff you're going to eat, but that I also might be cleansed by Almighty God on the inside as well, and worthy to stand before Him and before you and lead these prayers together. <coughs> This is how the Lord works to take the everyday, the commonplace, the ordinary, but use it to point to his everlasting and extraordinary glory. This is the fulfillment of the day of the Lord as promised by the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk, who mentions that even the pots and the pans, the cooking vessels on that day will point to God's glory. So what we do at an altar, we also do as a table. There is food here to eat. And what is simpler, more commonplace, more earthly, more human than bread and wine? And yet, here is that moment where, regardless of how else the service has gone, regardless of how else your week has been, Jesus has promised to be known in the breaking of the bread. He has promised that this is his body and his blood. It is real food that we can find nourishment in, and he will be here. And so this is the moment where we join with the angels and the archangels, and we know that Christ is among us.
Can we get the lights, please? All things come of thee, O Lord. And I know have we given thee. As we begin the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer, we start off with an ancient Jewish prayer referred to as the Sursum Corda, lift up your heart. The heart in Jewish thought being the center of your self. Not just your emotions, but what makes you uniquely you. And so we're asking to get to the heart of the matter, so to speak, and to take what makes you you and then offer it, raise it, lift it to the prayer and the praise of God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And it is right to give him thanks and praise. You will note then that the rest of this prayer is not directed to you. It is directed towards God himself. Though I might be saying the words, we are joining together, focused not on one another, but on lifting our hearts and these prayers to Almighty God. Uh, some time ago, we started turning off the lights during this portion of the service and putting on a spotlight. Well, on the stage, who do you put the spotlight on? Well, the star. I am not the star. You'll see later. When we have a moment, I'll step aside. The spotlight doesn't follow me. Who is the star? The body. It's Christ. It is his cross. Our focus here on the praise of our Lord and his holy presence. You will see me lift my hands into what is referred to as the Oran's position. Oran's for praying or prayer. In mosaics from the first few centuries of the church that have survived, we see the earliest Christians praying with hands outstretched and uplifted. And so as I lead us in these prayers, even my body might reflect that we are in unity with those who have gone on before. And as they prayed, so do we pray even now. <clears throat> it is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace we are able to trample over every evil, to live no longer unto ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. And with this first part of the prayer, the proper preface, we echo words of the bracha, the ancient Jewish table prayer, where God, the ruler of the universe, is thanked for bread, for wine, for the food and drink that we need. And we've also said a particular prayer that is reflective of the season of the church year, of some particular focus, so that we can be oriented even now as we are offering prayer and praise to God for the particular blessings of this particular time. Therefore we praise you, joining our voice of angels, archangels, all the company of heaven, forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. So in echoing what we see in Isaiah chapter 6 and in Revelation 4, let us join our voices with those who surround the eternal throne of God. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of our power and might, and heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That first section echoing the words of the angels and archangels. The second sec section, echoing the prayers, or the praises rather, of the people who are there in the end of Matthew's gospel as Jesus makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. They cry out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Quite literally, with that opening prayer, heaven and earth are joined. This next section, we remember the history of salvation. 
It always takes an element of what's happened before, especially in the beginning of creation, somehow moving through God, communicating to his people through the law and the prophets, culminating in Christ our Lord, and then what it means for us and for all eternity here and now. To be able to express the gospel in summary form, if you've ever found that to be difficult or tricky, what should I include or what should I not? To be able to look at the history of salvation in the beginning portion of any of the Eucharistic prayers is a fantastic place to start. So hear these words as we sum up in this time through Eucharistic prayer B, who God is and what he's done for us. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you made known to us in creation. The calling of Israel to be your people, your words spoken to the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error to truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. There is the gospel in its summary. We now move to the institution narrative, the words of Christ himself at that last supper before he was betrayed and dies. These words are found in all four Gospels. We take most of it, however, from the words of Paul writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, where he takes really all four Gospel accounts and summarizes them into a singular narrative. The night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. So we give him thanks to him, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. <coughs> After supper, he took the cup of wine. We give him thanks, he gave it to them. And said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. If the new covenant is the blood of Christ, what was the blood of the old covenant? The blood of the old covenant was shed through animals and their sacrifice for that atonement that needed to be done again and again and again on a periodic and regular basis. But now Christ, our eternal high priest and eternal victim, God's one and true Paschal Lamb, has shed his blood in a new covenant that is now good once and for all. <clears throat> Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. We offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. And in this now the epiclesis, I'm going to ask that the Holy Spirit would come down and do what we cannot. I don't have the power, I don't have the authority, neither did any of us, but God himself does. I'm asking that he would bless and consecrate that the ordinary might be extraordinary. That bread and wine might be the body and blood of Jesus Christ as he himself has promised. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. They may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Again, who can make us holy? Not our goodness, not our righteousness, but as I pray with my body, it is the cross of Christ and his spirit who can make us holy, and who can make us worthy. We continue now in the fullness of time. Put all things in subjection under your Christ. Bring us to that heavenly country with Stephen and all your saints. You may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, the author of our salvation. By him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. With different elements of these words, the concept of anamnesis, a Greek term that means something akin to remembering, 
but not just recalling something, but participating there in the past. In the same way, the Passover Haggadah, the story told together at Passover time, is told as though the people listening were freed from slavery, as though the people who were a part of that particular Passover service were brought through the Red Sea and had death pass over them. And we share in the death and resurrection of Christ, and we are there because it is our story. We belong to him, and all time belongs to him, past, present, and future, for he is the Lord of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So as we share this, we're not just sharing something that happened 2,000 years ago. We are grafted into him, therefore grafted into his story. This is our story too, and we share in his cross. We share in his eternal heavenly glory, and we share in communion, not just with God, with one another, and with all that body of Christ throughout time, throughout space, all over the world, and all throughout history. Now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Many of us hold hands, again, symbolizing with <coughs> our bodies that we are a singular part of his body, the body of Christ. The Lord's Prayer, when Jesus taught his apostles, you ought to pray like this, both giving us words in particular, but also a form and an outline where we praise God for his glory. We proclaim we desire his will to be done and not our own. We ask for our daily needs to be met. We seek the forgiveness of our sins as we seek to forgive other people. We ask that we will be able to avoid temptation. We will be able to be protected from evil. And in that last section, that doxology, words of praise, not words found in the Lord's Prayer by Jesus, but those are actually the words of King David. King David in 1 Chronicles 29 as the tabernacle is finalized, gives this blessing to the people. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. And by the second century, as witnessed to in the writing called the Didache, that doxology of David is attached to the Lord's Prayer of Jesus, and that is what we offer together. <coughs> and as Jesus broke the bread, as he is known in the breaking of the bread, as his body was broken on the cross for our sakes, so the bread is broken again. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Amen. Therefore, let us keep the feast. At this time, a song of praise, uh, often referred to as the Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God, echoing the words of John the Baptist, who introducing Jesus said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We have taken this moment, and we've been sharing different songs, uh, that again, I step to the side so that we can focus together for just a moment on the true star of the show. Not on me over here in the shadow. For now the presence of Christ is among us. We offer this praise to him. Continue on, please. Let us say together the words of the prayer of humble access. This was first written in the 16th century by the English reformers. But we speak the words of the Canaanite woman who approached Jesus to ask for the healing of her daughter. When Jesus said that he had come for the household of Israel, she reminded him that even the dogs get the scraps and the crumbs under the table. We who are not 
worthy of God's blessings. Yet through his mercy, we are grafted in. And not our own righteousness, but his righteousness has now made us worthy to come to his table and to share his body and his blood. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our righteousness, but in your manner. From the beginning, the church has wondered and debated and argued about the mechanics of how Christ could possibly be body and blood in bread and in wine. Uh, in Rome, we might refer to it as transubstantiation, that the accidents of this object, what it looks like on the outside or even what it would be <coughs> under chemical analysis, is bread. But its true essence, what it really is, has been transformed into the flesh of Christ. The Lutherans would say, how about consubstantiation, where they are with each other together. It is both bread and it is both flesh. The Anglicans have said, we don't know, but we believe his promises that he is really here. So that the details, the physical properties. It is a holy mystery, a holy <laughs> sacrament. We may trust his real presence is true without knowing or understanding the specifics and the details of how that might be. But Jesus in John chapter 6 says, I am the bread of life. Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. He restates himself at the Last Supper, that this is his body, which we broken for us on the cross. This is his blood, which will be shed for us, on that cross, and we trust him, even if we don't understand the mechanics. <coughs> his promises are good and true, and he is really present here with us. So as I prepare myself to not only receive Christ within me, but then offer this to you, you'll see me do this every service. For a centurion, once came to Jesus as he was preaching and teaching and said, I have a servant at home who is paralyzed. Could you please heal him? And Jesus said, I will follow you to heal him. The centurion said, wait, wait. I have many soldiers unto me, under me, and I know that when I tell them to do something, they do it. I have that sort of authority over them. I know you as Lord has the authority to make my servant well, no matter where you are. I am not worthy that you come to my house, but if you will speak the word only, I know he will be healed. So as that unworthy centurion spoke to Christ, I do too. I'm not worthy that you come to my house, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. I am not worthy that you come into my house, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. I am not worthy that you come into my house. Speak the word only in my social media. The body of Christ and the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ and the cup of salvation.
his blood received within us. Whether taken directly into the mouth or placed in our hands as making a throne for him. That we have received him inside of us. That if we are what we eat, we are now building our bodies and our spirits. Being nourished and nurtured by his flesh, by his blood. If we are what we eat, we take him inside of us so that we may be more like him. And now we offer thanks that we have received that. And we ask that through receiving it, we would have the strength, the wherewithal, the power, the ability, the encouragement, and the reminder to go do what he wants us to do. To live lives obedient to him, preaching and living his gospel. Reaching out to those who are in need. Leading lives that offer praise and thanksgiving to God. What would be referred to as the mass comes from the Latin word missio or mission. Send out. We conclude our Eucharist by saying, thank you Lord, now send me. Let us pray. Almighty and living God, we thank you for feeding us with spiritual food, the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. For children of us in the whole ministry, that we are living members of the body of your Son, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now the Father sends out to do the work that you have given us to do. To love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. things to bless or to pray for, though we will pass by doing that this Sunday, and I'll ask that you come up next Sunday. Here's the opportunity to hear the injunction of the apostles who said, is there anyone who is sick among you or in need to come and receive the laying on of hands of the elders and the prayers? That's why we pray together. And I always find it a blessing that we can pray not just privately, or you can grab me after the service and say, you know, this is what I need, or this is what I'm worried about, or this is what I'm suffering with. But as a body, we can lift one another up and know how others need to pray for and how you can be praying for the rest of the week. So I'd ask you to please stand as our service concludes with a benediction or a blessing. The blessing that I give seeks to combine Old Testament and New. The first half, the Aaronic blessing. The blessing of Aaron, the priest. And number six, God tells Aaron, this is how you ought to bless the people of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And then the New Testament blessing that Paul offers to the Philippians in, in chapter 4, verse 7. May the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as I ask for God's final, uh, final blessing in the holy name of the Trinity, I make a figure with my hands. In Judaism, where it was forbidden to make a graven image, God Himself was never portrayed in art. However... When they wanted to refer to God the Father, occasionally you would see a symbol of two fingers pointing downward from heaven. When you see traditional representations of Jesus, and he is showing two fingers of blessing, it is also a statement about his divine nature, that he and the Father are one. And as I bless you, I do so with both the fingers of blessings coming from the divine nature of God, but with my pinky touching my palm, for Christ is both fully God and he is fully man. So I represent the blessings of God Almighty and of Christ, <coughs> who is incarnate for our sakes. The blessing of God Almighty. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you, remain with you always. Amen.